never changing world, Off Hollywood Media presents a voice of truth and inspiration, resonating a vibration of love and understanding, illuminating new paths for new directions, as we, as one, strive for higher and higher levels of consciousness, always remembering life changes. And now, your host, our MC, our master of change, Filippo Voltaggio. Well, ciao, everyone. I am so excited about this show. We're going to be talking about shifting paradigms in a really big way. We're talking about shifting them in the corporate world. And it is happening, and it's going to be happening more and more. And so we have with us today on our show an executive spiritual life coach. Now, those words don't seem like they would go together, but they are, and they will even more, thanks to him and people like him out there doing this kind of work and people needing and recognizing how important this work is. Executive spiritual life coach and corporate spiritual consultant. His name is Robert Kwang Ju Wu, and he talks about integrating ancient uh, Eastern wisdom with our modern day problems and situations. And so we're going to be talking to him about this paradigm shift in the corporate world. So I'm looking forward to that. But talk about paradigm shifts. You know, it's interesting how uh, I've heard people say things like, wow, you know, if I had been around when Columbus said that the world was round, I would have believed him. Or, you know, other people that say, I wouldn't have killed Jesus, or those people that killed Jesus. You know, it's always been funny to me, because as far as I was concerned, even as a child, I used to look at people that would say that, because it's a good argument to have. We're so smart, aren't we, that we wouldn't have done that. And I thought, I used to think as a child, and I still do, people, you're killing Jesus every day. Uh, you know, you, you can't look back with hindsight, which is 2020, and say, oh, knowing what I know now, I wouldn't kill Jesus, or I wouldn't tell Columbus he was crazy, or I wouldn't tell Galileo uh, to, to stay in his house for the rest of his life under house arrest, because he believed that the sun was the center of our universe, as opposed to the earth. Now, you think about it, that's pretty ridiculous to think the earth is the center of the universe. Of course, not so ridiculous because there are people out there that think they are the center of the universe. So, so, you know, uh, thinking the earth is the center of the universe is, is a step, is a step in the right direction for them. But, you know, arguably now, actually the sun being the center of the universe is, is arguable. But at the time of Galileo Galilei, uh, he was saying that, the sun was, and not the earth. And so at the time, philosophers, some philosophers and some scientists and some uh, clerics of the church said that he was a heretic and a lunatic, and they made him stop saying that, and he promised he would. But then, of course, you know, the truth is the truth, as, as he knew it, and he went out and said, no, I can't stop saying it, because it's the truth, you crazies. You're the crazies, not me. And so he um, he was uh, he he was had to stay at home under house arrest and and not leave uh, and and share what he knew. And 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 his fate, one could say, was less than some of the others who had their heads chopped off or who died in other ways because they were saying things that weren't popular. And so going back to the people that are saying today, well, I wouldn't do that, or of course. The world, the earth is not the center of the universe. Or, of course, how could those people not know that the earth was round? Or, or of, of course, you know, Jesus had a message and Jesus was a good guy, didn't need to be killed. Well, you know, in hindsight, again, it, we could say, sure. But what about the people today that are saying weird and crazy things? Weird and crazy things like uh, someone I just interviewed a couple weeks ago, uh, Sheldon Neidl. He says that there are aliens living in the center of the earth, that the earth is hollow. Now, I know a lot of people that not only disagree with that, but think he's a crazy man and a lunatic. 
And, you know, I'm not saying one way or the other, but I'm saying, wait a minute, people. Are we doing what the people did in the Dark Ages? In, our, in, in so many ways, are we in the Dark Ages about certain things? Are, are, are these people prophets, in a sense, or are these people shedding, are scientists shedding light on something that, that, that we, from this vantage point, don't know? And then maybe, maybe a few years from now, or many years from now, or maybe even a couple of months from now, we might say, well, of course the world is round. Of course there are aliens living in, in the center of the earth. Of course the earth is hollow. Yes, of course. But where's the glory in that? Now, I'm not saying that I think the earth is hollow or there are aliens in the center of the earth. But I'm not going to be closed-minded to it because there were people that came before me, if I had learned from history, that have been closed-minded to philosophies that now we say, but of course. Take somebody else that we've interviewed, David Wilcock. He says there are rooms that the government has that are jump rooms. You go in them, and the door closes, and he says you feel a little sick to your stomach, and then you end up on Mars. Jump rooms to Mars. Or chairs that you sit in that the government has or the secret government has or somebody has that you sit in a chair and you're able to manifest instantly anything you want because of the, 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 the energy vibration or frequency or something that this chair can vibrate and make something appear. Crazy, huh? Maybe that person, David Wilcox, should he be at in-house arrest? I, I mean, uh, uh, are we believing it? And, and if we don't, do we allow for the possibility that there might be some truth to this? Are we condemning Jesus and Galileo and, and Columbus before they even have a chance? Are we going to be like these people that someday will say uh, about us, how could those people not have known or understood? Take somebody else we've interviewed, James Gilliland. Now, he says there are UFOs flying around his property all over the place, all the time. And that, that he gets messages sometimes that say when they're going to come by and what they're going to do, what formations and things like that. And he invites people to come up to his property to, um, to see them. Is he so crazy? Is it real? Are we condemning him? Are we making fun of him? Is there any doubt? Are we allowing for doubt or are we rather allowing for possibility? So I just think it's interesting how we are in our pride. I have these kinds of conversations all the time with people sometimes saying, oh, what you do is kind of weird. Is it really kind of weird? It, if Life Changes had been around interviewing Columbus, would we be considered weird now if we had been able to capture that information and, and, and had what Columbus thought on, on tape, <laughs> if there was a tape, uh, or on video, if we had had Galileo Galilei uh, interview from inside his house where he was under house arrest, uh, wouldn't we be interested now? Just maybe... What we are doing here today is capturing that information, maybe not for us, because maybe, maybe we don't, we'll never get it. I don't know. But maybe the next generation or the generation after that will. So it's kind of an interesting place to be in, I have to say, as we have these kinds of conversations with people, and some people say, wow, the work you do is really important, and some people say, that's weird. And I say, that's okay. That's okay. I just hope for the people that say it's weird that they allow, that they could, I wish they could suspend their disbelief for just a moment. I'm not saying I believe in everything either. I, I, I think a, a, a healthy skepticism is possibly important. I'd have to look at that. Uh, maybe because that's how I am, I think it's important. But uh, I'm certainly learning to suspend my disbelief a lot more often. So 
here I am. I hope we can suspend our disbelief as we bring on our guest today because there's something happening and he's got his fingers on the pulse about it and I can't wait to talk to him about it in regards to the corporate world where you would think that this stuff does not belong at all. So before we bring him on, I want to remind everybody that you're listening to Life Changes with Filippo and I am proud and happy to be your host, Filippo Voltaggio. And that you can hear us every Monday night on the BBS radio network. And, of course, you can learn about us at lifechanges.ws. And you can see us on YouTube. And you can see us on, uh, gosh, we're all over now, thanks to so many of these wonderful people that we're working with, um, Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. So come join our family and, and, and learn about us and come share your experiences so we can all grow together. So, again... Our guest today is Robert Kwangju Wu, who is a modern Taoist master and a spiritual investment banker. There are words that you didn't think you'd ever hear. A spiritual investment banker who studied and practiced for over 25 years with various traditional and renowned Taoist, Buddhist, and Qigong masters in Asia. Currently, is a business consultant in Orange County. Well, frankly, he is an executive spiritual life coach and a corporate spiritual consultant. That's really what he is. He is the founder of Transformative Coaching, which is an executive and life coaching practice that integrates spiritual practice in one's work and daily life. He is the author of the book, So Now, So Tao, A Taoist Approach to Harmonic Wealth, and is a member of the Transformative uh, Leadership Council. Kwangju Wu's mission is to assist others to achieve self-mastery of both their spiritual and material life. Please welcome to the show, and we're happy to have Robert Kwang Ju Wu. How are you, Filippo? <laughs> Thank you for inviting me to uh, participate in your very important uh, weekly uh, Life Changes um, program, which I think reaches and touches a lot of people. Well, thank you, and we'll be reaching and touching even more people as as we get out there more and as we get this message out. And this message today is important not only for us, but for the world, because you have your finger on a pulse that's so very important. Um, you said something interesting um, that I I really liked, and that was that politics doesn't run the world no, politics doesn't run the world, but corp- corporations run the world. That is, business runs the world. Um, politicians, in fact, uh, are run by interest groups that are basically uh, various interest groups that represent corporations. Mm. And so if you really want change, and it's interesting that... Um, that I, and I think Obama uh, really had had located the pulse of American uh, sentiment in wanting change. If we want change on a grander scale, um, the way that I see it to be most effective is by changing what happens in corporations, by changing and transforming our business leaders so that they, in turn, transform the way business is done. I think one of the, <clears throat> the, the focus on Wall Street right now and how Wall Street is being blamed for the financial crisis and if you look at the culture in Wall Street, you see that it really is motivated uh, primarily by money, not by anything other than that. And I should know because I was down there for over 20 years so, and I used to work with various big investment banks and so I have the inside look exactly at what motivates uh, the culture, the people there, and obviously the leadership. So when you have a culture uh, in business that is only looking to what they call increase the, the uh, shareholder's value, which is only in monetary terms, then you begin to, or you, you neglect to see the value that is created by your stakeholders, by the community, 
um, and therefore you fail to see that you want to maximize that value for them as well. But some corporations are becoming more what they call socially responsible, mm -hmm. and there's a huge um, following of people that like to invest in socially responsible investments. Mm. But that is only the tip of the iceberg. Mm. <laughs> well, so it is true, at least in the old paradigm, that money makes the world go round. Yes. And and I have known many people and, and, and have supported many people who believe that the new paradigm is about the the people, the, the, the masses, and that and that if we could change the 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 philosophy of people and so that they could help change the world that way. Well what you're doing, and I love this because I think we're gonna be all meeting in the middle, is what you're doing is you're working on changing from the top down. That's correct. That basically if we look at society as a pyramid and really at the top of the pyramid, uh, we look at various business leaders, let's say CEOs of various uh, large corporations. In a corporation, they can affect not only the thousands of people working for them, but all their customers, mm -hmm. the way in which they do business. Mm -hmm. And so if the top of the leadership changes and they become more spiritual, then that would permeate through the rest of the organization, and then it would reach all the consumers and the way that business is done, mm. so that business itself transforms. And so if you have a, a business environment and corporations that are not just looking to increase their bottom line, their profitability, but they really see making a contribution to society, not only in terms of selling their products, but doing contributions to community work, contributing to the families of the people that work for them, they become more humane, they, or let's say, I'm not, let's not, not use humane because they're not inhumane, let's say they become more compassionate, mm. they become a humanitarian, mm -hmm. and, and that's really kind of the, the coaching that I do is, is to actually help these CEOs or these top executives to realize their own spirituality, to have a, a spiritual awakening. You have very many successful CEOs who have a lot of money. If you look at even what's the millions of dollars that, that the Wall Street bankers have made, uh, if you actually meet them, they have all the physical wealth, Mm -hmm. But usually they may be very well on their third marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, their children probably don't spend very much time with them because they're too busy making money. And they may have been on their second bi heart bypass. Mm -hmm. So they have physical wealth, yet they don't have emotional wealth, nor do they have health, which is also wealth. Mm -hmm. And so... A part of my book, in, in my book, when I talk about So Now, So Dao, a Taoist approach to harmonic wealth, we define harmonic wealth really as being abundant not only in physical wealth, but also in your health, and in, emo in your emotional life and relationships, in your mental state of mind, to be mm -hmm. without that type of stress which leads to heart attacks, mm -hmm. and to have a rich, meaningful life through your spiritual connection to your inner self and to something much bigger than yourself. Mm. You know, this is reminding me of one of the nicest guys and, and actually him and his wife, uh, the, 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 one of the nicest couple you ever wanted to meet. And uh, they both practice yoga every day and they both had beautiful bodies. It's interesting how she practiced yoga because she believed that it would help her connect with her spiritual side. Right. And the, the, the fact that she got a beautiful body because of it was just a bonus. Yes. He believed, and the reason he practiced yoga is for the body. He yes. wanted to have the perfect body that he had, and he didn't care about the spiritual thing. But it's interesting because he was the nicest guy, and he said he didn't used to be like that, but he didn't focus on that. To him, it was just about the body. Yes. And so this was a side effect that really helped him. So 
I'm thinking now, because I know several executives and I've known over my career many top executives, and they don't, some of them don't care about helping humanity, and some of them don't care about uh, changing the world, but would care to have hell, uh, hell and to have better relationships and all that. Yes. And so connecting with their spiritual side would help them there, but without knowing it, it would help the rest of the world. Exactly, exactly, because when they become more integrated, when they actually are able to access what I call their inner self, the inner self, by definition, is a spiritual being. Mm. So part of the paradigm shift that you talked about is really understanding that we actually don't have just one self. We have two selves, believe it or not. We have what we call our outer self and our inner self. Mm -hmm. Our outer self is who we think we are. That's the chatterbox we hear in their mind all the time. That's, that's, let's say, when you ask a person, well, who are you? Well, I'm CEO of this corporation. Mm -hmm. That is an identification of a role, of a position in society. Mm -hmm. Or I am a violinist. I am a ballerina. It's oftentimes, especially in this society, your, who you are is defined by your job or career. Mm. That is really a part of your outer self. And our outer self is is pretty much conditioned by our external ecology. After we are born, we're, we're, we are conditioned by our, our parents' expectations, our education, our socioeconomic background, our culture, etc. And that shapes who we believe we are. But in this paradigm shift, we say, well, no, that's really just part of who you are. Mm. Who you, there's actually an inner self that is your inner essence, what in Taoism we call your true self, your authentic being, and that there is a voice that has that that this authentic being has. But the problem is that we're so focused on the external self and pursuing those external goals that we don't listen to our inner self. Mm. And our inner self may actually want has had a different goal. It may have a different purpose and meaning in life. And so you often see times, uh, you can also see times when an executive may have been very successful, made a lot of money, yet they're still unhappy. There's mm. something that's missing. Mm. Even if they have a great body because they work out and they're conscious of health and, and their marriage hasn't broken up, but there's something missing in their lives. They've mm. gotten everything. They've achieved everything, yet there's still something on missing. On the outer self. Exactly. On the mm. outer self, they've achieved all this. Mm. But there's something missing. What is that that they're missing? And that's that inner meaning, the connection to a mm. deeper level of meaning in life that allows them to ch achieve a happiness that has been eluding them by just acquiring and achieving things in their outer lives. Mm. You know, you say of that outer self that it has a voice, and that's what we hear usually inside our head, and you called it the... Well, we, in, 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 yes, in, in Eastern religion, whether it's Taoism or Buddhism, we call it the monkey mind. The monkey mind, right. And the monkey mind is constantly chattering. So for Crazy. those people who are listening right now, if you, think, if you just think that that constant voice that's going on in your head, well, that's your monkey mind. It's, cost, it's, it's also very judgmental. It's always saying, don't do this, don't do that. It's always judging others. You're not good enough. Exactly. For, yeah, they're not good enough. Yeah. Exactly. That's your monkey mind. Right. And your monkey mind really isn't who you are, but that's who we think we are because we think that that's the only voice we hear, so that must be me. Well, right, and that's the question is that, so people say, I have to listen to what what I'm hearing in my head in the sense that if it's coming from my head, it must be right. Exactly. And it, and it must be me. Right. But what you're hearing in your head is your outer self, your monkey mind. You can only access the voice of your inner self through meditation in the silence. Mm. When you go into that deep state of silence, you will actually hear a voice. And the conversation of that voice is very different than the conversation of your monkey mind. Your monkey mind is always about survival. How how to actually get to the next point to continue to get, acquire this and how to acquire that. It's a mechanism that we actually inherited from the times we were cavemen because our monkey mind told us, oh, watch out. We're going to watch out for that dinosaur. And 
Next time we see a dinosaur, we learn to run. Now, that same kind of stimulus response, you see that in a person who may have been bitten by a dog when they were five years old, and even to this day when they're 40 years old, they, they get very afraid when a dog passes them on the street. Mm -hmm. Well, that's because their monkey mind is telling them, watch out, you might get bitten. Right. The problem with the monkey mind is that it goes beyond just being bitten by a dog. It's whatever negative experience has impacted upon us when we were younger, mm -hmm. it makes a it stimulus response reaction so that even though let's say we were we went we were born and, and our our external ecology we were we were poor, right? The person was poor and so they have this poverty consciousness. And so even as they are successful, they're always feeling this sense of scarcity because mm. that's that monkey mind telling them again. However, that same person, if they were to go into a state of meditation and, and begin to access their inner self then they will access at the same time the experience of the infinite abundance mm. of the universe. Mm. And therefore, when they access that, they will be able to shift from a, a perception of the world being scarce to a world being abundant. And from that point, they will shift from just living a life of, as an executive of competition to a life mm. of a, as an executive of contribution. Wow. From competition to contribution is one of the trends that is occurring now on this planet. Mm. Through consciousness, through a shift in consciousness, through people accessing their inner calling, through people beginning to listen to their inner voice. Because once you begin to connect with your inner voice, with your inner self, you will begin to be inspired by higher values by higher visions mm. you will have a clarity in your mind that you didn't have before you will you will be in, be motivated to do and contribute more than just to make money for yourself and for the firm mm. i'm sitting here and i'm inspired <laughs> i mean you are just you're just I, the passion that you have about this you are definitely in your in your passion i mean this is this you you know this to your core and that's because I experience my inner self, and I listen to my inner self. And so when I coach a executive, mm -hmm. what I do is I coach that executive or that professional or that person to access that inner voice. Mm. And that's when the shift happens for them. And that's when they go back and say, oh, they have an aha moment, and they say, oh, wow, I mean, I can still manage my department, we can still actually end up making more money mm. because now as a executive, as their as a leader, I am not telling them what to do. I'm beginning to respect their opinion. I can listen more. I have more empathy with them. I have more compassion for them. Instead of just my instead of having my old paradigm which might be you do this, you do that, I don't really care about what happens in your life and your family life. You just show up and make money. And that is an old paradigm of what they call the command control model of management. You just give orders from the top and, the, and the, the people below, the subordinates, have to follow. However, now the shift is becoming, it's becoming more evident in more corporations where it's more collaborative, where they realize that it's important for the, your workers, your, your subordinates, your employees to really buy in. And they buy into the vision because you also communicate that you care about them as stakeholders so that you're not just interested in the stockholders, the shareholders, but you're mm. also interested in the stakeholders, the people that are associated with your corporations. And part of that also means their families and also their communities so that there is a shift happening in the corporations where they're, they want to give back where they want to become more green, they want to honor the planet, where they want to, to uh, back projects that are going to help uh, contribute to uh, improving the local communities and, and stop polluting the world, for instance. Mm. So that shift is beginning to happen already. And part of my role is just to uh, facilitate in any way that I can uh, by working with executives that um, are ready to make that shift. 
You know, actually, I, I think your role is, is also to uh, bridge kind of the stuff that has been mm-hmm. thought of kind of, kind of um, touchy-feely with the the three dimensional you know we got to make money business business mind and I, I want to talk more about that when we come back but I'm learning so much I mean from competition to collaboration I really like that and then you also said uh, the, the 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 corporation being responsible to stockholders and also to stakeholders and that is so powerful so. Uh, if you're just joining us, I want to remind you all that you're listening to Life Changes with Filippo, and I am your host, Filippo Voltaggio, and I am so happy to be here on the BBS Radio Network presenting our show every Monday night at 7 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time at the moment. Um, our guest today is Robert Kwangju Wu, who is a who is an executive spiritual life coach and a corporate spiritual consultant. He is so much more, and in, and along with all of that that he is, uh, like Qigong master and, and energy healer and worker and all that, he is an author, and we have been talking about his book, So Now, So Tao, A Taoist Approach to Harmonic Wealth. I, I have to say this for those who might not know. There was a time when I didn't either. Tao is pronounced Tao, but it is spelt in our language T-A-O. So if you're looking for his book, you will find it under So Now, So T-A-O. Right, yes, and and, and if and, and they would have, right, I'm putting it on Amazon.com soon, but right now they would have to, if they're interested in my book, they would have to go to my website, right, which is www.modern, M-O-D-E-R-N, Dao, T-A-O, dot com. There it is. Okay. I wanted to make sure we got that out. Right. So, so Robert Kwang Ju Wu's website is modern, spelt like modern, Dao, T-A-O, dot com. Right. Exactly. So, uh, well, for some of you who just don't care, it's modern Tao, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so, we've been talking about uh, so many things, that this major shift that you are helping facilitate uh, from the top down, uh, helping executives uh, change the way they're thinking or adapt their way of being into the new way of, of thinking and being. Yes. Um, and, and, and part of that is that a lot of people, myself included, when I used to be in the corporate world, thought that we could live double lives. Like we, we could shut what our beliefs are, our religion or our family or whatever, and go to work and, and we, would, we could be this robot that only cares about the money and doesn't care about people's feelings and order people around, etc. Right. And then we can go home and, and, and be the nice family member or then we can go to church on Sunday and be pious or whatever. That doesn't really work, does it? No, it doesn't. And it, it, and it, it didn't work for me either. Because I used to live a fairly bifurcated life. On the one hand, I was down on Wall Street um, in these firms uh, and in these investment banks. And I have to admit that I wasn't really happy there because I wasn't driven and motivated by greed. And I saw my colleagues who were, and they made a lot more money than I did. Mm. I just didn't have that, those set of values. And um, I would work there. And then when I went home, and on the weekends, I would be uh, a spiritual meditation teacher. Interesting. And so I felt that I had a, uh, a bifurcated uh, life and that I needed to bring, them, bring the two together, my experience in business as well as my spiritual teachings. And so becoming an executive spiritual life coach was really the ideal platform that began that allowed me to integrate both my business experience with my spiritual teachings and experience as well and to be able to bring that back to the business world where there is so much need for corporations and for top executives to awaken to this trend because it's good for business as well. There have been some studies that show that when you become more humane or spiritual, that productivity in the firm actually increases. So unlike what people may think that when you're nicer to your employees and you're taking a more spiritual approach 
to your business that it will decrease profits. It's actually the opposite. Your when you become more spiritual, your employees end up being more inspired. They work harder for you. Productivity and profitability goes up because also you're becoming more aware of what's happening in your marketplace with your consumers. Many more consumers are, are becoming uh, selective in terms of who they buy from based on their policy. So if you look at certain socially responsible, what they would call lojas, where they actually, consumers will buy certain products and not buy other products based on what their orientation is. So if a company is a major polluter in uh, in the environment, they will not buy that. They may buy from a corporation, their competitors, who may have a more green approach. So one of the things, the trends you're seeing now is that many corporations are going green. Why? Because humanity, because consumers want to support things that are green because it helps the planet, it helps sustainability. And so that is uh, one of the trends that are that is occurring. And that's an exciting trend. So I was right. You are bridging uh, your your philosophies here with with uh, your, your your training also your your executive training because you've been CFO of large corporations yes, and yes. all that. So you're, you're you're bridging here. So who better than you to be able to help people uh, see how important this is at this point? But is it is it because something is changing, or could this information have served us years ago? Would we have gotten it as executives, as well, businesses? Well, I, I, I think that um, there's there that if someone brought this up even 15 years ago, mm -hmm. and even talked about meditation in a corporation, and certain corporations actually allowed meditation to occur they actually have uh an hour where people can actually meditate really yes and, and, and a place in a place wow. and, and some corporations actually allow yoga to be done corporate yoga is actually quite popular now. but now no. now yes okay. yeah for instance my, my wife she teaches corporate yoga she's a yoga instructor and and she teaches and she teaches executives as well corporations wow what a team you yeah. two are and so yeah my, my wife lena she does an amazing job and so um, we like Lena, by the way. Hello, <laughs> Lena, if you're listening. And so, um, and so, it's essentially, everything has its time. And so, this impetus now for the shift is is both a reaction and it's both active and proactive and, and reactive. In other words, it's reacting to where consciousness in the mass public is beginning to shift, mm. and also it's being propelled by various thought leaders uh, and uh, writers, etc., that's infusing and media that is infusing this new consciousness for the public. So we're not saying that anybody was being obtuse or anybody was being wrong necessarily at the time for doing things the way they were doing. No, it's because just, we'd like to, but <laughs> exactly. It's just that sometimes when you get someone who is a visionary and they are too advance in their times and you interview quite a few of these people who people they they think that they're too woo woo mm -hmm. because they are before their time mm. and so let's say when you gave the example of the of the shift uh when galileo broke the uh, you know the, broke the, the silence the <laughs> that, that well in fact you know we, the, the, we're not like Copernicus where, you know, everything <laughs> revolves around the earth, right. but actually we're revolving around the sun. That right. shift in consciousness um, is results when a, a visionary begins to articulate mm. an idea which is later adapted. But sometimes those same visionaries are condemned and crucified mm -hmm. for their visions. Mm. For instance, as you mentioned, Jesus, right? Uh, because the masses at that point may not have all, or let's say the powers to be, mm -hmm. were not ready to adapt that view, and so that that new way of thinking was a threat to the status quo, and and it's it's the same right now is that certain corporations are making these changes, 
um, other corporations don't want to 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 um, to unstabilize the status quo, and so certain corporations will be open to the type of coaching I do, while others may not. And if they're not, they're going to be. Well, well, <laughs> I it, mean, not that you're going to make them, no, but no, no, it, it's really the trends. I mean, there's actually a book called uh, Mega Trends 2010, and mm-hmm. you know she talks of, and documents. I've seen that. Yeah, yes. really, that the next trend, super trend, is going to be spirituality, mm. and it's um, you know one of the one of my clients. They're you know media company, and 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 they have identified that that particular just in media and spirituality. Uh, if you look at that market is an $800 billion market. Mm. You know, you you uh, are from that culture that you bring here. I, I don't mean that culture, but you're, you're from the Asian ancient history culture that you're bringing into our modern day philosophy. So you're the real deal. You, you, you get both sides of it. Yes. But what I know about you and what I see is that you're not saying that people should be um, dressing a certain way or listening to a certain kind of music or, or believing in a certain religion. And you're not saying they should be running through fields picking daisies either. Right. You, you're, you're somehow grounded in, 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 in this culture, all, our culture, and you understand it. And you also understand your culture and you say, well, there's some things that we knew that can apply here. Yes. But we don't have to just completely change who we are in order to... Exactly. And, and that's kind of what I talk about in my book, which is applying the ageless wisdom of the East to modern-day problems in the West. Mm-hmm. So in, in, in the ancient uh, Asia, they didn't worry about problems of career. Yet career is one of the biggest issues that we all worry about or, or focus on in the West. Isn't that true? Mm, absolutely. And so... Um, and we probably infected the East now with exactly, that too, right? Exactly. So they almost need you there now. <laughs> You're probably right. <laughs> um, You're going to have a huger career than you thought you had. You know, I'll probably have to uh, shut up from Asia to, to the U.S. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. But the, the good news is that just like that, we can infect the world, so to speak, or change the world to, to, to worry about career or to, to, to drink certain things or to dress certain ways, we can also help remind them from here, thanks to people like you, that there's also a, new, a, a different way of being. Yes, exactly. And um, I, uh, the, the, one of the things that uh, you mentioned is that there's a different way of being, and that difference of being, again, goes back to understanding who you truly are. Hmm. To be able to access your inner being, your authentic being. And by accessing that and integrating your outer being with your inner being, Hmm. by integrating your physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual life into a harmonious wholeness, Hmm. you will then achieve harmonic wealth and happiness. Hmm. You know, Kuang Chu, I think that the biggest issue here is fear. Um, a fear of the unknown and fear of how some of this has been presented. Some of it does seem airy-fairy, but doesn't have to be. And also the fear of if, if I all of a sudden adopt this new way of thinking or being, then I won't be as strong, I won't be as powerful, I won't make as much money. And as you said earlier, there's even potentially more money to be made, exactly. more wealth to be had, and exactly. not just financially. Exactly, that's right. This is there. It is not a zero sum game, mm. which is what existing business operates from. That is, we operate from a notion of limited resources. But when you access this inner power and this access to a spiritual force in your life, you realize that it is not a zero sum game, and that there is. Tremendous, infinite abundance and supply in the world and in the universe. And it's knowing how to access it, 
and how to share it. Mm. You know, every other sentence you say would be a a great place to stop because it's just such a powerful thing to say. But I don't even want to stop here in case there's just one more piece of wisdom that you want to share with us. Because I'll tell you what, I'm ready to to go and and be the executive of of Life Changes here, uh, uh, inspired by you. And I feel like I've had a, a coaching session I, I, I feel like I can be grounded and, and, and make money and, and, and have a business and not have to give up my beliefs. Yes, it's very true because one of the misnomers uh, is that you have the two extremes. Either you believe that you can make a lot of money and not have any spirituality. And so you see a lot of executives, they make a lot of money. And it's true that they don't have any spirituality. Well, which is what I grew up with. Yes. If you want to, if you're going to be rich, you you got to be a crook, or you got to lie, or you got to cheat somebody out of their money. Right. Well, I don't think you have to do all those negative things, but essentially, if you just focus on the material world, then you don't see the importance of spirituality. You cannot use spirituality in a corporation. That word itself, or especially in Wall Street, mm. they that's that's almost like a bad word. That's why when I tell people I'm a, a spiritual investment banker, they scratch their head and say, "What man, are you crazy? <laughs> but what I'm saying is that you can be both. Mm. And, and so you have the other extreme. You know a lot of people who are very spiritual, and they're having difficulties just paying their bills. Right. Because they are under the misconception that to be spiritual means that you don't have to have, you don't need anything material, and to have money is bad. Mm. So that's, that's the other extreme. So what we say is you can have both. You can be both spiritually and materially abundant. For that truly is our God-given right. And we have to be because that means balance. Yes. And that's the Tao. You said the Tao is balance in... Yes. It's having balance in all those aspects of your life, in your spiritual and material life, in your physical, spiritual, mental, emotional life. Wow. Well, I feel balanced and I feel complete. Oh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> and, that's, that, and, and I think more people felt like you and more executives felt like you, they'll be able to, to disseminate that understanding to the people that work for them in the mm-hmm. corporation. And that corporation will begin to disseminate it into the world. And in that process and, and in the multiplication of that happening with other corporations, the world itself will be transformed. Mm. Mm-hmm. Well, with people like you out there doing this work, then it, it will indeed. So thank you so much. I know that there are executives of small corporations or startups that are hearing you. Can they contact you too? Yeah, absolutely. And my, okay. my clients uh, run from large to medium to, to startups. To start, it's, okay. not the, it's really not the size of the corporation. It's really the intention of the executive and what they want to achieve as they are building and growing their corporation. Okay. Do you want to give, of course, we're giving out your website. Uh, I have another website. Okay. Yeah. But my website for coaching is www.transformativecoaching, one word, transformativecoaching.com. Okay. So there's uh, moderndowtao.com and then there's transformative coaching.com and so they can reach you that way yes. and and get the benefit of your wisdom for their corporation and for the world well I hope so <laughs> <laughs> thank you Robert Kwong Ju Wu for being with us today and inspiring us and all of our listeners well, and thank you for having me on this show Felipe. it's been a pleasure thank you <laughs> <laughs> well this is very exciting I feel like there's there's hope for the future and that, uh, that those of us who are working from the ground up uh, now know that there are people working from the, from, from the top down. And I feel at some point we shall meet in the middle and, and celebrate. And that is, that is my vision. So with that, I'd like to bring on uh, another visionary who is our... Um, uh, is, well, she's so much. <laughs> I don't think I have time. So let's bring on Dorothy Lee Donahue with uh, How to Be the Change You Wish to See in the World. Wow, what a great show. I want to tell you tonight about a very special young man 
who lived a full life in only 14 years. At the age of three, this young man started to write poetry to cope with the death of his older brother. His name was Matty Stepanek, and he was an American poet who had six books of poetry, reached the New York Times bestseller book list, as well as one book of essays. And when he died, a former president read his eulogy, and over 1,350 people showed up at his funeral on June 22, 2004. This is interesting. He became a peace advocate and motivational speaker, and he lobbied on Capitol Hill on behalf of peace and people with disabilities and children with life-threatening conditions. Maddie suffered from a rare form of muscular dystrophy that resulted in his death just before his 14, 14th birthday. And yet, he lived such a full life. Many of us have lived much longer and offer much less to our world. Although Maddie suffered tremendous pain, he said this to Jimmy Carter in one of his many letters to the president. I choose to live until death, not spend the time dying until death occurs. How many of us are making that choice? I can only speak for myself, and now I am truly choosing to live and to live large. However, I wasn't as wise as Maddie, and for many, way, way too many years, I chose to be a victim. In fact, as I've shared before, I had a Ph.D. in victimhood and a master's in pity me, but no longer. I love life, and I have a song deep in my heart, similar to the one Maddie wrote, about it, that he wrote about in a poem when he was only six years old. I want to share with you his heart song. I have a song deep in my heart, and only I can hear it if I close my eyes and sit very still. Even when the going gets rough, it is so easy to listen to my song. If my eyes are open and I'm so busy and moving and busy, if I take time and listen very hard, I can still hear my heart song. It makes me feel happy, happier than ever, happier than everywhere, and everything and everyone in the whole wide world, happy like thinking about going to heaven when I die. My heart sound, heart song sounds like this. I love you. I love you. How happy you can be. How happy you can make this world be. And sometimes it's other tunes and words, too. But it always sings the same special feeling to me. It makes me think of Jamie and Katie and Stevie and other wonderful things. This is my special song. But do you know what? All people have a special song inside their hearts. Everyone in the whole wild, wide world has a special heart song. If you believe and magical musical hearts, and if you believe you can be happy, then you too will hear your song. I want to read to you just a little from Jimmy Carter's eulogy. Maddie said he wanted to be, as an ultimate goal in his life, an ambassador of humanity and a daddy. Maddie had already named his first seven children and had even given personal idiosyncrasies and characteristics to the first four. He wanted to leave a human legacy and family descendants, but Maddie's legacy obviously is much greater than that. As has already been quoted, he said, I want to be a poet, a peacemaker, and a philosopher who played. Maddie was deeply aware of international affairs and shared a lot of his thoughts with me. He was once again in the intensive care unit when the war in Iraq began. And Maddie burst into uncontrollable sobs of grief and anger. His mother, Jenny, said he had never cried nearly so much about his own health or his own problems. He wrote me right after that, and I will quote exactly what he said. Dear Jimmy, I am hurting about the war, and I cried last night when I saw the attack on Iraq. 
I am not trying to be disrespectful, but I feel like President Bush made a decision long ago that he was going to have this war. Imagine if he had spent as much time and energy considering the possibility of peace as he has convincing others of the inevitability of war. We'd be at a different point in history today. Maddie was obviously extremely idealistic, idealistic, but not completely. He also wrote me in a subsequent letter, I know that I should be peaceful with everyone, but it's also not so smart. To put yourself in a dangerous situation, like even though I would want to talk to Osama bin Laden about peace in the future, I wouldn't want to be alone with him in his cave. In the same letter, he asked me if I would join him, not just in that meeting, but in writing a book that Maddie wanted to call and had already named Just Peace. In an incredible way for a child his age, he analyzed the semantics of the word just. The title was Just Peace, and he said just had so many connotations that he thought that was the best word to put before peace. He said just could be a minimal expectation, just peace, nothing else. It could mean just peace, and peace is a paramount commitment above everything else. And it could mean peace that was exemplified by justice. I want to thank Maddie for the gift he was to all of us. It was quite obvious that he truly became the change he wished to see in the world. And I trust that each of you out there listening tonight will find your heart song. So until next week, please remember that you are the power in your world. You are the guru you have been waiting and looking for. You're the only one who can end your suffering. And you can only do this by beginning a love affair with yourself. So please choose to become a very conscious co-creator by making elegant choices. And never forget that you are powerful beyond measure and that you are loved, you are lovable, and you are loved. Thank you, Dorothy Lee Donahue, for that. That was absolutely beautiful. And uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to send out to one of our most ardent listeners who lets us know after every show how we did. Uh, her name is Ginger, and we love her a lot. And we know that just today she is going through some surgery, that, and so she will not be able to hear the show, but she'll get to hear it in the archives, and she'll hear and she'll feel it right now that we're sending her love, we're sending her light, we're sending her energy for a speedy recovery and for her to be better than she even was before. So we love you lots and look forward to your, um, your next email, letting us know how well you are and how we did on the show. <laughs> and with that, we have come to a conclusion of yet another very special show that we are so proud to have presented. And we were so happy to have had Robert Kwang Ju Wu as our guest on the show tonight and we thank him once again and do go to lifechanges.ws to learn more about him as well. Our guest next week is also a uh, business person. She is uh, going to be talking to us not from the executive level down but from more of a business level up and so we look forward to uh, hearing what she has to say from the worker perspective, uh, changing the executive ideas, um, I think that's going to be really interesting, and it aligns a lot with uh, what we talked about today. I hope I said that right. I'm actually trying to understand it myself, so we'll, we'll get to learn together more tomorrow, with, or tomorrow, next week. And remember, you keep, can keep the conversation going during the week like Ginger does by email, but also on Facebook and at our website and on Twitter and all these wonderful things. Uh, connect with us. We're happy to connect with you. Today's show has been made possible in part by our sponsors, Ionways Water Systems, Change Your Water, Change Your Life, and Love and Miracles. And to learn more about them, visit our sponsor page on our website and click on their links. I am Filippo Voltaggio, and it has been my pleasure being of service by hosting Life Changes with Filippo tonight. I, along with our segment hosts and producers, Dorothy Lee Donahue and Mark Lejour, and our engineer, Seth, thank you for joining us and being part of this show. 
being part of the change we all wish to see in the world. Ciao, everyone. You have been listening to Life Changes. Join us here every Monday night at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time and visit us on the web at lifechangeswithfilippo.com. That's Filippo, F-I-L-I-P-P-O. And follow our community on Facebook at Life Changes with Filippo. Join us here next week as we consciously embrace and explore the only constant, Life Changes. Life Changes.